So good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much um, for coming along to the second DRACMA um, meeting. Um, and this is organised by both me and my colleague uh, Patrick Courtney. And we've got two fantastic presenters today, but I've just got to go through just a little bit of housekeeping. One of the things that Patrick and I um, have been doing over the last months is organising a special issue in the journal Drones. Um, I will forward a link via um, the email addresses at the end of this, but I just want to remind everybody if you've got a cracking bit of research associated with your drone activities, it could be user cases, it could be technical stuff, um, we would be very interested in um, exploring whether we can get that into the special issue. Um, so our first speaker um, is Astrid um, and um, she will be talking to us um, about her recent experiences um, in Africa and I'm going to um, uh, leave her to introduce where she is and what she's doing and then after that um, we'll have um, about five minutes of questions and then we'll have um, Sheldon coming in to talk about his work with defibrillators. Um, so what I would ask is I'm going to have the chat box open. So if you've got any questions as we go along, please put them in the chat. Um, I will try and then um, um, sort of moderate those. If there's just one or two, I will um, just ask them straight. If we have a lot of questions, then what could I, I? I would ask you to vote on those and give us a thumbs up so we can so we can ask the most popular questions in the time that we've got. Um, this is being recorded, and um, I have just now managed to pop it onto uh, YouTube, and I've just sent you a, a link to that. If you haven't got that link, send me an email after this, and I'll, I'll and, and, and I'll give you that. So just to make you aware, this will be uh, visible by the public. But without further ado, Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you can go on the next slide already. So let me give you just a, a bit of background from, from my side so you know who's talking to you. Um, I'm Swiss. I'm an epidemiologist by training from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Currently, I'm based in uh, Madagascar, and here I'm working with the Institut Pasteur, and uh, mainly on tuberculosis research and control activities. And in that drone project, uh, drone project I'm going to talk to you about, I was uh, sort of the monitoring evaluation lead. Next. Yeah, so the project we're talking about, it's called Drones observed uh, therapy system in remote Madagascar. Um, it was a proof of concept project. Uh, we started in 2017 um, and I think we ended by the end of uh, 2018, so almost two years. Uh, the project focus was on tuberculosis uh, because both our PIs uh, were actually TB researchers from the Stony Brook University in the US and the Institute Pasteur. And uh, also the funding came from uh, TB Reach and we had a budget of like 400,000. Um, the project region, um, you see Antananarivo in the, like the capital in the middle of the country, more or less. Uh, and then the project region where we implemented this drone project was, um, was in the south, south central Madagascar. Um, Basically, what you do, you drive 11 hours uh, in, in the south on a road that is that is fairly good. Um, fair, I say fairly, but nevertheless. And then you you if you click once more, Paul. Yes, so you get into into you get off the better road um, to get into towards the project area, towards actually the health center where um, which was our base. And that is another um, five, six hours on this kind of terrain that I think uh, a lot of you are familiar with. And then uh, if you put next. So at some point you arrive in that small little town, which is already very rural. But then in order to get to the villages where the people live, 
Um, do I look at the raising hand or? Oh. So if, uh, if you go to the villages where the people live, um, basically you have to, to walk. There's no way to go there by motorized transport. So it's going through rice paddies and across rivers. And in our study area, this actually translated to like multiple days of walk uh, to the nearest health center. Next. Yeah, so at the end of the walk, you, you will arrive in a, in a village like, like this. It's super beautiful, uh, but as you can see, also very, very remote uh, and very impoverished. Um, just to give you a bit data on like the TB situation, I think we in, in the project, we went to around 60 villages and, and in about a third of them, we found uh, TB patients. Um, yeah, and as I said, it's multiple days of walk, and for someone that is sick, it's it's not ideal to also or even impossible to do this journey. So hence the the need for the drone. So here's what we in like very schematic. This is what we tried to do. Uh, in those villages, the way it works in Madagascar, they have uh, community health workers, and what we plan to do is train these community health workers in recognizing. Um, TB suspect cases. Uh, once they recognize someone, they suspect someone, they would call in the drone from the, from the health center. Um, the health center would send the drone containing um, this kind of uh, sputum container. The community health worker together with the patient, they would take a sputum that is then flown back to the diagnostic and treatment center where it's being analyzed for TB. And um, if the patient was found positive for TB, we would, as so the drone would be used to send um, the drugs um, for the TB treatment. So this is what we, we plan to do. Basically, it's really like bringing the diagnosis and the care closer to the patient. Next. Yes, so what we needed for this, in order to achieve this, is we wanted a drone that can do a range of about 120 kilometers. So basically going 60 and, and coming back 60. Um, we needed also a high degree of autonomy. So no manual piloting. So it can auto, uh, autonomously take off, fly and land. It would just follow a GPS, GPS predefined flight path. Um, as you've seen in the picture before, in those villages, we really couldn't install any runways or launcher because they're so uh, scattered and, and remote. So that that the drone uh, doesn't need that. And um, yeah, at least at one end uh, of the journey, um, we, we have a community health worker who potentially doesn't have any technical skills. So the idea was to have a drone uh, where you on the way back, someone could just push a button or so and the drone would fly back to, to its base. And for us, we didn't need a lot of payload. We, we said like one to two kilograms is enough for flying the, the samples and the, the drugs. So that is what we wanted to have. Um, next. Now I'm already diving into uh, the challenges. Um, so for us, the main challenge was really um, having a, a, a functional drone. Basically, very early in the project, we needed to switch the drone provider because he couldn't um, deliver a functional drone. So if you press next, maybe again, um, it's coming to the second challenge. So basically, we had to look for another drone. We had to look what's on the market. And um, by that time, I'm talking 2017-18, we didn't find a technology that was really like fit for our purpose uh, and especially out also the context. But we identified one um, which was doing the, the, also the quadcopter uh, and the, uh, the horizontal flying, which was the Delta Quad uh, from vertical technology. But we needed to do some, you know, designing then afterwards um, in Madagascar in order to make it more fit for our purposes. For example, we, we had to arrange a bit for the payload um, department because that was not originally in the drone. If you go to the next one, 
Um, and then the third main challenge in Madagascar was basically that um, the country didn't have any drone specific flight regulations. Um, they started, I think, by the time we wanted to start the project and um, by the time we finished the project, they still didn't have a, a regulation. They, they were still in uh, developing it. So basically for us, that means delayed fly permit approvals and we had to renew them, I think every every uh, like three months or so. That was just a, a bit lengthy and, and cumbersome process. Next. So when we look at the outcomes with, with the drone flying, we can say we, we had test flights um, with our payloads. Uh, this worked. Um, we had about six flights where we actually had dummy payloads, but we also didn't have any flights where we, where we uh, used them for the intended purpose of like um, transporting samples or, or um, drugs for TB. We did not get to that stage. Um, yeah, the drones that we then eventually used, they, we found them uh, to be a bit prone to technical errors. Um, I think once it like kind of smoke, uh, um, there was a development of smoke, but uh, when it started, so that's where you can see the burnt wires. And I think once there was a technical glitch and it, it crashed into a tree or so. So as I said, not really uh, ready yet. Next. Can you hear me again? Yep, we can hear you fine. Okay, let me give you some uh, impressions from the field. Uh, this, of course, when you go to the village, it always uh, attracted a lot of uh, attention from the villagers. If you go next. Uh, here, it's a bit dark, but you can see the drone hovering a few meters above the ground in the background and uh, in front uh, one of our technicians. That was one of the successful flights. And then the next one as well, very nice picture of the, basically the drone flying over this study area with what um, a rainforest area. And uh, you can just see the vastness and uh, how, how it could be much uh, faster by drone than going by foot. Um, next. So for us, the main outcome at the end of the projects, we, we really thought we, we could uh, deliver a proof of concept uh, we've done the, the test flights and mainly we saw the potential it could have. We didn't uh, achieve uh, with the like integrating it in the local health system, but nevertheless, I think we, we made a case that it's, it's theoretically possible. Then um, very, very good outcome for us that was the two major health service providers um, in Madagascar which are PSI and MSH, and their corresponding funders, they actually plan to continue to integrate drones into their health service provision activities in, in uh, Madagascar. I'll come back to this point a bit later. Then what we did find, though, is that, um, yeah, there was really, because we didn't really fly um, with payload, we saw we didn't have a lot of data, primary data, but we did have a wealth of, you know, evidence, anecdotes and, and experiences. So if you go to the next slide, uh, really during and after the project, um, we, we were contacted um, like repeatedly by, by, for example, researchers or donors, sponsors or consulting groups or other implementers who asked us about our experience, our lessons learned, our challenges, and also if we have already any evidence, so any data. And um, as I said before, we just had a, lot, a wealth of experience and we, we actually looked around in Africa, who else is doing the bi or trying the bi-directional drones uh, transport. And um, there were, I think, four other projects and, um, we had a very good co collaboration then with the teams in Malawi, um, which was UNICEF and um, Village Reach, who implemented drone projects there, and then in Senegal as well, which was PATH. And uh, yeah, we put our heads together and um, 
we, we talked about uh, our experiences in this paper and we really thought we should make it accessible to the public. So this is an open access publication. Mm, next. Yeah, I'm not going to do justice to the to these two projects, so I apologize. I know even some of the, the people are here on the call, so I let them chip in later. But just very briefly uh, on their challenges and outcomes over the course of their projects. In Senegal, they actually had the same problem with the same uh, drone provider, which couldn't deliver a functional drone. Then they also had, um, it was a challenge to for example, import these, um, these uh, batteries that are used for the drones into the country. We had a similar problem in, in uh, Madagascar. And then they also, for them, it was challenging to find the funding, especially the, the follow-up funding after the first um, yeah, proof of concept. Then the main outcomes there, they were actually able to do, also to de develop drone regulation with the authorities. So by the end of the project, they did have uh, regulations and they also managed to um, develop all the SOPs around the drone flying in the country. And then in Malawi, if you put the next slide, um, I, I said I'm sure there are other challenges but the, the main one I picked out was that uh, while test flying they had some interference um, with the cellular towers in uh, where they tested it, so more like a technical uh, uh, problem. And then they had uh, some nice achievements. Uh, first of all, they, they like with the government, they established this kind of drone corridor, which allowed uh, users to test and fly without going through very lengthy and cumbersome, you know, regulation processes. They also did a costing study of drones versus motorcycles. Um, it's not a cost effectiveness study, but nevertheless, it was one of the first data on this that was available. Um, they also developed drone regulations and very importantly, the Ministry of Health actually decided that they want to move forward with this project in those two um, pilot uh, districts. So next, um, we, we did in a paper as what analysis, so across all those countries we put together what are the what are the strengths that we see, the weaknesses, the opportunity and threats. I'm not going to go into the details here, but I just want to um, encourage you to, to read those if you're interested. Because uh, if you go to the next slide, I'm more going to focus on the recommendations that they came out of those, um, yeah, based on our experience in, in, in the three countries. Um, we did this on different levels. Uh, for the implementers, um, we saw there's really a lack of data and the need that these are actually publicly shared. So we encourage those projects to collect the data and make it um, publicly accessible. This is like could be health uh, impacts or cost and cost effectiveness or acceptability and so on. We actually in the paper also um, listed some indicators that we proposed that um, they should um, collect. Um, then also, yes, there, like there are sometimes multiple drone projects going on in a country and, uh, it, like they're, they, they can be very complementary if you, if you, one is doing long distance parachuting, like zip line is doing, and another one is really doing more bi-directional, like we were trying. So that's very complementary. And uh, it's, it's important that these are well coordinated um, in order not to burden the local health system and the Ministry of Health with competing interests. That's what we uh, yeah, felt in, in, in one of the countries. Um, and then very importantly, build local capacities around so the drone project can actually be maintained locally. Um, for that, the local capacities, you could partner already with university and, and schools of technology to, to have the young talents uh, being drone technicians and so on. And if you go to the next slide, um, I'm, I'm talking especially also Madagascar here. We, uh, a bit uh, towards the end of the project, we really felt like we should have worked earlier with, with someone like We Robotics because the approach, what they cover, is really what was missing for us. So they had this uh, local, one of the elements they do is the local capacity building. Um, uh, next slide. 
then for the policymakers, um, the recommendations that we have is to to yeah have a favorable environment and creating this by flexible and short regulatory approval processes for flights permit and for new technology as well. Um, yeah, and even, I mean, uh, our projects were all funded with foreign funding. So um, often even governments that cannot maybe contribute financially, they play a paramount role in like facilitating the project approval, negotiating between the parties and coordinating also between the stakeholders. And uh, they should really be behind the project and like champion it, uh, even though if they don't uh, contribute financially or not massively financially. Um, and then again, uh, they should also demand that um, this can be supported locally or maintained locally at a certain stage and thus um, local capacity building is, is, um, is needed and should also be supported by the, by the funders. Next. Um, yeah, recommendations to the drone manufacturers and, and, and service providers. Um, we all felt that the technology that we used at that stage, I'm talking like two, three years ago, was not yet ready for, for this real, real world context that we worked in. It was, I'm sure it's very different now and uh, there was a lot of development, but at the time we were really like urging uh, this uh, drone manufacturer to um, build what is needed in these countries. Um, yeah, it does make a compelling business case um, around the whole system. For example, providing drone technology, spare parts, repair parts in countries or, or businesses that can import uh, this technology and, and associated equipment. Um, yeah, so that's the local business opportunity. If you go to the next one, this is the second element of the flying lab approach, right? To incubate those uh, local businesses around the whole um, system. Next. Uh, so the last recommendations uh, were for the donors and sponsors. Um, that was in 2019, right? We felt that donors still need to be more aware that they invest in a technology that is not yet very ready for the purpose uh, and it still needs iterative development. Uh, so a bit of flexibility um, in the funding is needed um, so that implementers can basically keep up with the technology and uh, how it develops. And uh, eventually that uh, <laughs> results in longer term investments with funds that go beyond this pilot project. There's more recommendations in the paper if you want to read, but uh, in terms of time, I limit myself here. Um, I think I have one last slide if you uh, move on. I just want to uh, tell you what happened in Madagascar after we finished our proof of concept. Uh, we were actually, we had the best uh, outcome that we could imagine. Um, we were basically invited together with PSI, one of the healthcare providers, to write up a concept note and present it to the Global Fund because the Global Fund wanted to invest in um, supply chain innovations in Madagascar. And the PSI was already partnering with a, um, a service provider, which was called Aerial Metrics. And uh, yeah, they, they were able to move ahead with, with the Global Fund. And that was really great because someone could take it at scale. And uh, at, I think maybe a year that, down the line and maybe a year ago, they partnered with, uh, so they created the Flying Labs Madagascar. Uh, which was again something we actually thought was the ideal case. And this is the last bit of news that I heard, is that a couple of weeks ago they flew apparently the longest range drone delivery in, um, in, in Africa. That's um, my last slide and I thank you for your attention. Ashford, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for that. That was a that was a lot to get into 20 minutes. That was superbly done. Thank you for that. Um, the, the papers open up uh, open for questions. We've we've got about five minutes, and in the chat, I've got an excellent one from Alex. And here we go. 
Do you agree with the recent WEF and Deloitte paper with respect to the challenges of drones in Africa? Are regulations the challenge or healthcare economics? So you've seen, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the, with the paper, but uh, in terms of, of regulations, you see we were struggling with that. Uh, but other countries really were more faster and more advanced. So I don't think the regulation part is um, everywhere a problem. And there were very uh, innovative approaches in, for example, with the drone corridor, but also in Rwanda, where they have a very, um, they, they, um, they facilitate the use of new technology and new drones in a very clever way uh, before you know, it's going to scale. People can test something in a, in a certain environment and then it's going to scale. Um, so I don't think that drone regulations is always a, um, a big challenge in all, the, in all the countries. As in terms of um, health economics, I, I assume um, they mean cost effectiveness of the intervention. Um, we did do a cost effectiveness analysis. I'm not the expert on that one. Uh, I can recommend maybe my colleague Simon to present that one day. Um, it, it becomes uh, cost effective as, at some point. Um, but basically what we learned is obviously the drones are not going to be always more cost effectiveness uh, uh, cost effective than a, a car or a a motorbike but there are certain contexts uh, where they're going to be cost effective and uh, it's really important that each context finds the space where where the drone really fit and where the drone is really cost effective but I, I'm not going to go further on this cost effectiveness. Uh, yeah, I'm just not an expert. So, so I've got a, I've got a sort of a, a technical question. I know that this space has moved on a little bit from 2017 to now, but um, you, you, you said a functional drone was not available. So, so what are the key specifications that you require? What, what weren't the drones conforming to then, and how have they improved? So what I think was really, I mean, not ready in our case is that at what I said with at one end of the, of the flight path, you have someone that is no technician and he wouldn't be able to, you know, fly a drone. He's a, a community health worker somewhere. Um, so without technical knowledge and really to have this, this, like this button that you can push uh, or yeah, push that it flies back. I think I'm not sure if they're even there yet now. I'm, I'm not uh, super up to date with technology, but um, that was I think that was our ma major challenge in terms of technology. Um, and uh, George has given us one quick one at the end here, which is what kind of data were the most challenging to get in your project? What was the most challenging data to collect in your work? So for us, we did um, some ex uh, acceptability um, data. We wanted to do uh, drone performance data. And given that we didn't really use the drone, um, yeah, we didn't get to the stage where we used the drone in the in the health system and in the villages. We only did testing. So basically, I can say we don't have drone performance data. So yeah, that is for us. It was the was diff we we had a system in place where we could track stuff like technical errors or uh, kilometers flown and. Uh, and all these drone related indicator, which by the way, we, as I said, we have a, a list of indicators in the, in the, in the paper, but we were not able to, to collect any of this data. But, but, but it was enough to tempt some cracking funding at the end of the project. So, so even, even, even a limited study really did grab people's attention in terms of the global funding that you, you, you achieved at the end. So. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that started even before we started. I went to, I'm from Switzerland. Before I went to Madagascar, I went to the Global Fund in Geneva just to bring it on their radar. Yeah, yeah. And uh, actually that turned out, so I'm not saying that's the only thing that brought it to their attention, but it helped that uh, finally they were really um, jumping on the train uh, after the project. Yeah. Fantastic. Right, Astrid, that was brilliant. And you brought it just just perfectly in time there. We're just a minute over, which is which is brilliant. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, which is good. So if I could ask other members of of the network, if you um, please, please ask questions. But if, if you can do that in the chat um, and then we can go through that at the end and please keep your microphones on mute and and also your cameras if if you're if you're if you don't want to appear which is good so here's sheldon sheldon's um uh, uh, shared his screen so sheldon i think the floor's yours fantastic uh first of all thanks so much for having me but astrid's talk was fantastic and and so many of the same challenges i i love the portion about funding Grant funding takes you so far. Eventually, you're going to need other funding to make these things work. So uh, that was a fantastic talk. I'm going to give you our talk in terms of where we are with respect to the use of drone technology for rural and remote cardiac arrest. Uh, the future is now. Uh, the following is my disclosure slide as well as a research funding slide. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about a little bit in terms of evening the playing field with respect to cardiac arrest. How do we improve outcomes from rural and remote cardiac arrest where access to public access to fibrillation is extremely challenged? So in cardiac arrest here in Canada, we have 40,000 cardiac arrests uh, every year. Um, the UK would uh, obviously be a larger number, bigger uh, area, uh, but for us, 40,000 a year, yet only 10% of patients survive. So 10% of patients of all comers uh, survive. So clearly, um, we can do better. And the reason for this is cardiac arrest is a time sensitive emergency. With every minute uh, of time, we decrease survival 7 to 10%. And with our current EMS systems, even the best of systems, six to eight minutes is a response time. If you do the math, you can see that the vast majority of patients who sustain cardiac arrest are behind the eight ball right from the get go. How do we actually engage the community to improve outcomes from cardiac arrest? So in this chains of survival concept, the first number of chains are critical. The 911 call, early access to CPR and defibrillation, and then the following uh, care with respect to ALS and in-hospital care. But the front part of the chain is really critical to survival. And how do we improve <coughs> our community response to uh, cardiac arrest. Well, we know in many jurisdictions, bystander CPR rates uh, may be 40%. Uh, that's what we see in our jurisdiction, 40 to 50%. Many are much lower, but eventually with bystander CPR, you're eventually going to need, in most cases, to use a defibrillator. These automatic external defibrillators are extremely simple to use. They're everywhere, uh, generally, except, as you'll find out, in rural and remote communities. But one of the challenges of automated external defibrillators is many people don't know where they are. Many people do not know how to use them, making, in fact, the actual use of defibrillators incredibly challenging. In fact, when we look at overall cardiac arrest, only 3% of the time was an AD applied by a bystander in cardiac arrest. And even in public locations, 15% of the time, a defibrillator is actually applied. And that's the great problem. The vast majority of cardiac arrests, 80% happen in private locations. So homes, how do we get access to those in rural communities? much quicker. In fact, when you speak to someone who survives cardiac arrest, they'll tell you one thing. I was lucky. I was lucky that someone knew CPR. I was lucky that someone was able to apply an AD in a timely fashion. Our research wants to take the luck out of the equation. So here, look at this. Isn't this gorgeous? A beautiful rural community in an island. This is great to live in until you have a cardiac arrest. 
you have a cardiac arrest, it's not so good in some of these particular communities. And the reason is very simple. Again, it's math. Rural and remote communities, 12 minutes. I guarantee in Astrid's area, it's a lot longer uh, than 12 minutes. But many rural communities in Canada, response time is extremely delayed. Think about that in our equation and why survival is so challenged. So as everyone knows, drones run manned air vehicles. Uh, you can see here they come in all different shapes and sizes. Here are certainly some bigger ones with larger payloads, but the drones we use in our particular research are the, again the beyond visual line of sight drones. So we're not using drones in our research that people fly around in their backyard. These are very similar to the ones Astrid showed you, unmanned air, uh, UAVs that are monitored remotely. These are fully autonomous drones. They have payloads depending on the size of the drone and can go at a very, very high speed of travel. Range is going to be very, very dependent upon the size of the drone. To get the type of drone that you'll need in Astrid's work, it's going to need to be a lot bigger uh, than the drones that we're using in our work. But again, for our jurisdiction, 15 to 30 kilometers is a long range for rural remote communities. And you can see here, how many people are using drones for commercial use, medical use, as we've just seen. My focus as a cardiac arrest researcher is AEDs to victims of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We published our first work uh, a number of years back in circulation where we actually looked at optimizing. So we did a geospatial modeling in terms of mathematics of optimizing a drone network in Southern Ontario. So could we decrease response time in Southern Ontario when we compared it to our historical norms? And what we found that if we optimized the drone network, we could improve response times in urban cardiac arrest by almost seven minutes, 11 minutes in rural cardiac arrest. Given the numbers that I've shown you in the time, this could clearly have an incredible impact on cardiac arrest survival in these particular communities. But again, this is mathematical modeling. Is it feasible? And a number of years ago as well, we published our work on what is known as the AED on the fly, the drone delivery feasibility study, improving access to rural and remote communities for the use of drones. And our picture really, after mathematical modeling, was is it feasible? And our vision was the following. The call came in to the 911 dispatcher. The 911 dispatcher sent the signal to the drone dispatch. The drone dispatch signaled the drone. The drone would take off. The drone would land. The bystander would use the AED and everyone would live happily ever after. So this looked great in terms of how we perceive this would happen. Let's take a look at this video in terms of our drone delivery study. I um, can't hear the voice, I'm afraid. Sheldon, we, we're having a bit of trouble hearing the voice. Is the commentary absolutely essential to this? I think we'll just have to look at the pictures. I think the pictures are going to have to tell us the story, but they. I think Sheldon's just stopping that now. Oh, here he is, fantastic. Sheldon, we're having a bit of trouble hearing the commentary on your video. Could Sorry, you, bro. Um, we're having a bit of trouble hearing the commentary on your video. Could could you talk over it? I've tried to to, to figure out could a technical solution. Any, uh, could you hear any of it? Uh, no, not afraid. Um, no, we, we couldn't, I'm afraid. OK, no problem. So basically what you're seeing here a uh, test flight using the drone where we're actually uh, dropping the drone or landing the drone 100 feet from the site and actually flying it in the final scenario. So here's our drone flying three particular flights at the kilometer to these flights. Here are some of the other situations. 
in another scenario. So actually looking at uh, to actually provide medical and uh, is his own transfer kidney for transfer uh, is one. Here's me talking about the fact that I think it's very feasible. I think within the 12, 13 months, you're going to see this happening as part of an I. It's too bad that you weren't able to hear the voice part. So this is what I, yeah, I always find when we use video, uh, the video is very informative, but it's only informative if you can really hear it. But you can see here, uh, we were incredibly happy with our, this is the town of Caledon, um, which is just north uh, of uh, Toronto. All the flights, these mock 911 calls, uh, everyone, the EMS actually, the were second to the drone. So the drone was their first uh, in flights of six to eight kilometers here in the county of Renfrew. Again, huge savings in response time. We flew about nine to 10 kilometers, larger county, uh, bigger savings with respect to response time. Here's a drone that we use, it's called a Sparrow drone. Uh, this can go about 15 kilometers, payload of about uh, 10 pounds. And you'll see here, a Zoll AD3 defibrillator here, if you'll see a smaller drone, uh, but the smaller drone was able to carry what we have here is a Schiller defibrillator, much, much smaller. You can see the size of it. So again, the size of the drone you use will really depend upon uh, the size of uh, your payload that you need to carry. Uh, one thing I think is incredibly important is this qualitative research. So you need to understand, certainly in our area, do the communities accept the use of drones for medical reasons, particularly in cardiac arrest? If the communities don't buy in, uh, your likelihood of success is going to be uh, incredibly low. So we published some work uh, recently uh, looking at our experience and our qualitative research, and it was very interesting. Drones are a great idea, but what the heck is an AED, which is incredible. You would have thought it was the actual the other way around. The fourth themes that came out of our qualitative research were very simple. Uh, why our community? So most rural communities may not realize that survival is not as good as it is in urban centers. Is our EMS response sufficient? It may be, but not necessarily in rural communities, uh, in, in particular for cardiac arrest. What are the liability challenges? And lastly, uh, we love drones, but how the heck do you use an AED? And that really, really allowed us to focus our next phases in terms of optimization of our projects. How do we make the drone AED interface as easy as possible for the provider? Uh, we had some challenges, and the real first challenge from Transport Canada, so the regulator was, it was quite clear that we weren't going to be able to actually land uh, the drone. We had to develop another technique, whether it was by cord, whether it was dropping the drone. You can see here some of our early testing in terms of dropping an AED defibrillator. <laughs> that, drew, that went about 45 feet and that defibrillator still worked, but we wanted to make it a little more, um, a little more uh, realistic. Here's some flights. Here's our drone dropping a flight from 15 feet uh, within 10 feet of a Mach 911 arrest. Here you'll see our drone dropping uh, the AED package. So this is all concealed in a, in a almost a indestructible package. You'll see there we drop it from about a height of three feet. The provider gets the AED and then brings it back to uh, the bystander. Uh, we wanted to make things simple as well. So what we actually did was we affixed to the defibrillator a FaceTime app. So in fact, we could speak directly to the bystander as you're actually going through the intervention. And you'll see here, this is what it looks like, which was really a, a simple little solution. Uh, and by improving our process, you could see here how we improved our descent speed, improved our descent time, uh, improved our distance to provider, and our time to actually apply the defibrillator. Here's what it looks like. You'll see here how the provider is actually looking and speaking uh, to our head of our community responder programs. These were actually mock uh, flights and mock 911 codes, where again, you can see them looking at the screen and every one of the providers said the exact same thing. Having someone speak to me while I was doing it, not on a phone, but on the app made it feel 
like I was being helped there, felt like I had someone there helping me along much, much better than the actual codes and all the instructions that the defibrillator kept giving them. So it really made a huge difference for the confidence of the bystander. And you'll hear here from our central dispatch, he sees everything, he's able to see exactly where they are, he can guide them and hand position for CPR and guide them through the process of actually placing uh, an AED. We've done night flights as well. There's, we've had no issues with respect to flying the drones uh, at night, which is very good. The next thing we've been able to do is we've been able to fly in extremes of cold. So you can imagine here in Canada, we've done some work in Fern Forest, minus 30 degree temperatures, we're able to do it. Where drones have issues are really wind. Drones don't like wind at all. Uh, so if you can't fly a plane due to wind, you're not gonna fly a drone. In urban centers where you've got lots of high rises, wind shear may be an issue for drones. So I think people might perceive, hey, I can land a, a drone on the, on the balcony of a condo. I don't think, think we're actually there from a technical point of view, but those aren't issues in the rural and remote communities uh, that we in fact work in. One of our final steps for us uh, is really uh, the process a vetted, a vetted route. So I love the idea that I heard from Astrid of a drone corridor. What we need to do with Transport Canada, our regulator who's been very supportive, is all our test flights, and we've done a large number of them, have been through vetted, um, uh, vetted directions. So they know the address ahead of time. But in a cardiac arrest with 911, you don't know where the address is ahead of time. Being able to send the drone on those is our critical last step to implementing this is part of a 911 EMS system. So I see our, our future dispatch process is something like this. Currently 911 calls, fire police, ambulance are sent, but in rural communities we're going to dispatch not only our community responder program who are equipped with defibrillators, but our drone program to sites that are very difficult to reach. We hope to improve response time, decrease the time to first shock, and improve outcomes from cardiac arrest in rural and remote communities. So I'm so happy and thankful that you've allowed me to present our work here, and I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Michelle, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think both of the presentations uh, today have just been brilliant. Um, I, I, I was a little bit too controlling with the last questions. I didn't allow, allow people to talk. So I've got two, I've got two people that have asked some excellent questions here. So can I ask Deirdre, can, can you un, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Sheldon. What Hi, a great presentation. You. Amazing. Of course, thank all the best ideas come from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm really interested. I know that your area of expertise is cardiac, but I'm interested whether there's been any conversations around, because I think a brilliant use case um, would be delivery of naloxone in opioid or opioid overdose. I don't know whether there's thoughts around that and whether there's been any consideration in the current crisis to use of drones for deployment of vaccine. And I'm thinking specifically with my Canada head on of like really rural communities, you know, like Inuit communities. So, you know, my, 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 my stepmother like worked as a doctor and she used to have to go for months and months. So they, they are really remote. Um, whether whether that's being considered and looked at and could speed up uh, kind of public social regulatory acceptance. Yeah, so two great questions. My feeling, and I think this goes a little bit to the economics that Astrid brought up and in, in, uh, in the cost benefit. I think because of the relative infrequency of cardiac arrest, I perceive the future is going to be the medical drone. And what we're working on with some of our grant funders is a medical drone that will include not only an AED, but include epinephrine for anaphylaxis, naloxone for opioid overdose, stop the, stop the bleed trauma kit for bleeding and trauma situations. Um, all those things are going to be included in what, what, what I perceive as a medical drone so that you have the drone used for multiple medical emergencies that are time sensitive. In that way, the cost equation becomes better because you're going to be using the drone more frequently for a larger number of medical emergencies. So there's no question in my mind 
When we look at just one emergency, such as cardiac arrest, the cost could be prohibitive. If we increase the use to a larger number, there's no question that'll be beneficial. We've already done as well. So early in the uh, pandemic, we were using drones to provide COVID testing uh, to multiple remote communities. So we would send the COVID testing kit to them by drone. They would do the test. We take it back by drone and look at the results. We can do the same thing with vaccine. We've been approached by a research group in Oslo, Norway, to look at moving um, blood samples from one teaching hospital to another uh, in downtown. Also, it's amazing that drone would be quicker than cars there. Uh, but again, who knows in terms of weather, etc. But that use is very important. The key there is be able to control the temperature of the payload. So the payload compartment has to be controlled to take stuff like that. So those are the considerations you have to think about. So if you think in the mind of COVID vaccination, um, the Pfizer shot, Moderna, need to be at a very, very cold temperature to be stored. You would have to control the payload. Having said that, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, those could easily, easily be uh, dispatched by drone uh, in many of these communities. So certainly we've done some work with that with respect to COVID testing. The use of taking it for vaccination, I think, would be quite simple. And one more thing, sorry, uh, we're so on the same wavelength, Sheldon. So like you better take us along in the UK, you know, because uh, I, I think it's, we're just thinking the same way. I think it's incredible. And I love the multi, the idea of multiple use cases, uh, medical use cases contained within one drone. Taking that a little further, what about, um, have you considered as well, um, and it's kind of following on from, the the um, the app the smartphone app that you had to be kind of a helper alonger doing next step telemed um, included within that within that drone unit. Um, so that's a, so very very interesting. So the people that we're partnering with with respect to um, uh, the first aid component uh, is is Zoll Medical. They're a large defibrillator company, as everyone knows. But they had purchased a company known as Mobilize, and Mobilize develops first aid solutions for just what we're doing. The beauty of the solution, though, is it's built for bystanders who don't know anything. So what happens is you open up the kit and it has the app there that guides you for the solution. So um, does a patient have bleeding? Click A, B. If it's A, then go down to the area within the kit that actually has the bleeding kit. How do you apply it? So again, very, very great point that you make because many people may not know how to use an EpiPen or naloxone. So the instructions in that process must be somehow made within the kit to be most applicable to most bystanders. A brilliant Amazing. Thank you very much for that. I've just got a few questions that are coming in now. I think some of it generated from your question, Deirdre, which is great. Um, I've got, um, is it Ali, Ali Reza? Ali Reza? Yep. Um, hey, hi. Uh, hey, Ali. Uh, 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 that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm, I'm a professor at Boston in the US, and we are always sort of uh, uh, heavily restricted by FAA rules. and. Uh, you know, in terms of operating drones in urban area, what, what is the regulatory path in Canada like? How how easy easily you can operate these things so, uh, in the urban area? Ali, I think that's a great question. I've been contacted by many in Boston um, because of where the one of the funders is, and so Transport Canada and the FAA, in my mind, are do, are getting much more better, much more responsive. I think the key is how you're dispatching your drones. So in the, in the group that I work with, um, Drone Delivery Canada, we have an actual base that actually is able to see all the local airspace and able to see all flights within that area. Now remember, local airspace, these, these planes are gonna be flying way higher than the drones are gonna be flying. But if you can't monitor local airspace, there's no chance you're gonna be able to fly drones. There was a recent announcement that BVLOS flights could be done for drones in in the US. But again, it's very specific if you read it, Las Vegas in the desert where there's no flights, along power lines where you're not going to be able, you're not gonna fly any plane. Those are the areas where you can do it. So it's not the real 911 call. And I think this is the next step that we're doing. So we have the technology 
to know what's in the airspace. But you need to be able to have drones that don't lose signal. So they go from our drones go from RF to cellular to satellite. So you don't lose signal on route because that's how you're going to lose a drone on their particular path. So I think we're getting there. I think by doing these vetted flights first, we're getting the, the confidence of the regulator. But the next step, I think, is going to be the key in terms of being able to show we can know where the drone is along its complete path, uh, as well as being able to go to a location where we don't know where it was in the first place. So I think we're doing better. Uh, but again, I love this stuff with Astrid about drone corridors and basically, you know, putting off space to actually allow the drone to fly. Where we don't have trouble, we don't have trouble with regulated flights. Where you have trouble is flights that don't need a flight plan. So, you know, so, so recreational or people are flying at lower levels, those are the trickier ones. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Brilliant. You're welcome. Um, Alex, I think you've got a question um, around um, integration um, in the technology. Alex, are you there? I am, yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, Sheldon, fantastic, really enjoyed that presentation. I mean, thank he's you. already asked the question pretty much, but it was very much a case of, you know, you, you mentioned already you're going to need multiple use cases to generate the uptime of the economics to come down. How far along that journey are you, have you progressed or is that an aspiration? And obviously the costs will come down or have some studies already been carried yeah. out aspects? So, so we explored the using the drone just uh, for AEDs and it was it would be cost prohibitive. And the reason is there's a large infrastructure cost to setting up the drone stations. Once you've got it up, the monitoring isn't as big, it's the infrastructure cost. So I think we're far along because we're actually right now doing our test flights with our medical drone. So that's our next step to be able to see if we can in fact do uh, can create the drone that can have the payload capacity to carry it, which I think is very simple. Like the technical part I think is not difficult. I know we can get a drone from point A to point B with our with our technology, so I don't think we're that far away from it. But unless you think about it in in um, in a multiple use scenario, I think it's going to be very very difficult. And grants are great for testing. At the end of the day, the the payer is going to be a municipality, a region, etc., and you need to be able to make it cost effective to be there. I don't think we're very far off at all, Alex. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, of looking at this wider dispersion of the drones. And once you have it, once you disperse it amongst other jurisdictions uh, and other rural communities, uh, then you're off to the races because the more you have, the less the cost becomes. Thanks, Sheldon. Completely agree. And I might pick up with you separately on that because that's exactly what I'm working on in my business. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, is it Kato Al, uh, Zhang? I think you've got a question about um, a bit of clarification about remote or autonomous navigation. Are you there? They asked a the question. Hi. Uh, yes. Oh, brilliant. So, um, yeah. So that's a great talk, uh, Sheldon. I'm uh, Sheldon. So I'm more like. Uh, working on the drone technology. Um, so we, we are looking for the application uh, for the, like which uh, this type of the first aid. So my question is more like a, a technique. So is is the drone is like um, uh, controlled remotely by a pilot uh, or is that a autonomous navigation approach? Very, very good. We I've worked with two companies uh, both of them are autonomous, so you get GPS location A, GPS location B, you press a button and the drone goes autonomously. So that's right, and we can fly a drone, so uh, Deidre knows Canada, I can fly a drone from Toronto uh, in Vancouver, okay, because uh, it's simply the coordinates, so the technology is there to be able to do that. Where you need to be a little bit more specific and have perhaps some manual override in our process yeah. uh, is... So landing of the drone so you need to have a camera on the drone so on, on descent you make sure if i'm dropping an ad at a gps low coordinate that coordinate could be the roof of the house i need to make sure that i'm dropping the drone uh, or the ad in the area that's accessible uh, to the bystander so we would tell the bystander go drop a towel on your front lawn i can see it we can drop it and we can do it so the vast majority of these flights are all autonomous so the another issue could be the GPS based localization is has a very, very large um, you know error so that might not be precisely drop there your 
uh, package at the side you wanted. So um, I'm not sure what's the exactly the <laughs> the tolerance of the uh, delivery at the side. I think the, so. I think the key there is if you're using GPS coordinates and the precision to five this to five digits, you're going to be pretty close. But you do need, and this is the difference between using a drone for commercial use i.e. taking a package from point A to point B where you know those points ahead of time and it's all vetted out. But for medical use, you need to be able to see where you're going to actually drop it. So I think the vast majority is autonomous. The descent part, though, needs the ability to manual override to ensure that you're actually not bringing the drone into a tree, into the house. Uh, there's a lot of things that you need to be able to see on the descent piece, which you don't need really for the commercial project that's actually already been pre-vetted. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sheldon, the, the conversation is just fantastic. We, we've got applications and technology being discussed. I've got an eye on the clock. We are a minute over. Are you are you happy to answer a couple of more more questions? Just yeah, just no, two. for sure. This is this is fascinating, and I think this is the beauty of this. Like I listened to Astrid's talk, and I can tell you so many of those initial challenges that we had so we you know we eventually had a drone we, you know our first flights we'd get the drone to the area but the descent speed was so slow that you were losing the benefit of response time that you made up with the drone as the drone flies straight as the crow uh you don't that's the benefit of actually cars going up and down streets and turning in these rural areas so but we needed to develop technology to ensure improved descent uh, so all these types of little nuances that are critical, uh, I do find with, as Astrid said, uh, the drone, there's many drone companies that will tell you many things uh, until you actually work with them to be able to see what they can actually do can be a challenge. So I, I, I completely understood what Astrid said there. Uh, absolutely. Brad's got a, Brad's got an excellent question uh, about embedding um, this technology and techniques with, with paramedics. Uh, are you, uh, are you there, Brad? Yeah, I'm here. Fantastic. Crack on. Uh, a really interesting talk, Sheldon. Um, yeah. one, of the, one of the things I was curious about when you started mentioning how, you know, this could be applied to naloxone delivery, epinephrine, other emergency life-saving um, medical interventions, is that some of these situations, especially, you know, thinking of the naloxone, may predominantly be occurring with populations that may not have the ability to um, run and drop something in a, a field for uh, for the, the drone pilot to see. Now, my curiosity was if if the plan is to excuse me tr train the drone pilots who are licensed to fly beyond the you know beyond line of sight to try to be able to recognize through the onboard cameras what an emergent situation like that would look like. Or if there's some any plan to involve paramedicine or other health trained emergency response uh, professionals to be able, to be working alongside them to be who have those that uh, expert knowledge of what an emergent situation looks like to more readily and quickly identify what the situation is as soon as they arrive on scene. Yeah, so I, I think our hope always here, so our paramedics are are incredibly well trained to use epinephrine in the long zone. So if the paramedics have already got there uh, prior to the drone, then you don't you didn't need the drone in the first place, right? Um, I think the key is um, the ability of the call responder, the call taker, to be able to vet the information that they get and be able to recognize the emergency and continue the passage of the drone. So what I mean by this is one of the challenges in cardiac arrest or any type of emergency is you may be dispatched to a call that may seem like that. But by the information you get as the call goes on, you realize that in fact that's not what is going on and you need to be have, have the ability to bring the drone back. So I think the key, um, Brad, in that particular question is a dispatcher who's actually listening to the call, has control of whether I send the drone or not. That to me is the key in terms of ensuring you don't have a lot of false positives uh, in terms of your drones being sent. Because if you're sending drones to lots of calls, 
where by the time you get there, it's not an emergency, then you're really wasting a resource because you're taking it out of use for when a real emergency actually happens. So I think the paramedics that we use are generally embedded within our dispatch system to ensure we're trying to send the drones to the right calls. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. That's helpful. Excellent. Thanks. Um, and we've just got one one last question. There's a couple of excellent comments that I'll I'll feed to you at the end, um, uh, Shell. But George, you've you've got a question about um, e calls or, or or phone help. Are you there, George? Yes, just buttering with a mute button. Thank you, both. <laughs> excellent <laughs> presentation, Sheldon. Thank you. Um, Thanks, George. I was wondering how easy is it to find somebody in a field or in such a situation, especially if you have a drone coming there. And I know in a transport, there is the ecosystem already in many of the vehicles that perhaps could be integrated. Appreciate part of that may have already just been answered by the previous question, the paramedics. So one of the tricks is um, one you can get as soon as the, as, as the person calls us from a field, they're usually calling us on a cell phone. So we know what the GPS coordinate of the cell phone is, and therefore we're able to more closely localize where the actual call is. Otherwise, if it's in a jurisdiction, like let's say I'm at the cor I'm at the intersection or my field is at the intersection of A and B. If we know the intersection, by getting the drone there as quickly as possible and then using the camera on the drone to visualize the area, that also improves, improves our ability to get to that particular zone. But really it's being able to use the GPS coordinates in the actual telephone to be actually able to get to that particular site. So that will help us a fair bit. It, listen, to be totally frank, we're not going to be able to get to every situation in all scenarios, and we realize that, but really, if we're able to save one, two lives, what's the cost of a life save versus the cost of this whole program? In my mind, um, when you're looking at some of these communities, survival on these, like they have a cardiac arrest and there's no EMS response for 15 minutes, they have no chance of survival. At least we're giving them an opportunity to survive and hopefully by expanding some of the uses, we're able to help other emergencies as well. But I, I'm not, I'm not so altruistic to feel that we're able to get to everyone. There are going to be situations where we get to calls and they're not cardiac arrest. That's part, I think, of the learning process. Fantastic, Shelton. That's brilliant. So um, I've just got a comment that I'm going to read out from Alex. He's really picking up your point about uh, making sure that you are detecting everybody else's drones and the manned aircraft in your sort of safety piece. Um, uh, Deirdre's sort of just uh, touching base with you in terms of um, the Canadian the, Ca the Canadian healthcare system and 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 implementation there and um, I think Deirdre again she's 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 giving you a big thumbs up about the about the conversation so Thank once you. again um, Sheldon that's absolutely Brilliant. And, and hopefully, I think Alex was wanting to connect with you afterwards on one or two. Hopefully then it'll it'll create some more conversations afterwards and, and, and possibly some research links and some funding, because yeah. that's the point of this kind of thing, which is which is good. Um, yeah. I'm afraid we do have to bring the, this lovely conversation to an end <laughs> now. Um, I've got to ad, ad, advertise for next time, which is the, the next fir first Thursday in June. And um, we'll have Patrick uh, Mayer, who is going to be talking about his experiences in terms of embedding uh, drone technologies within within communities and touching on many of the points that uh, Astrid raised there. I, I very naughtily, I took the decision, um, and Patrick and I took the decision to actually open up one of the sessions because what's happening now is our conversations are going way over the hour <laughs> so so we, we'll, we'll, we'll have one tremendous talk just like today and in the first um, uh, meeting and then we'll open up the floor to get some more of these conversations going to see if we can capture some of these ideas and and planning a few things forward so on that note um astrid and sheldon thank you very much they were really inspiring talks and and i'm gonna i have to remember to stop recording or otherwise we can't uh, <laughs> otherwise i'll lose the recording and just to know i will send you um a link for the youtube 